Welcome to Love Fraud Live. And um, today we're going to be talking about surviving a sociopath. Um, maybe because of your entanglement with a sociopath, you found yourself doing things that you never ever did before. Things that you would never even have considered doing, like acting out or plotting, scheming, and investigating like a detective. I'm Donna Anderson, author of lovefraud.com, and tonight I'll explain that to survive a sociopath, you sometimes may need to act like a sociopath, but that certainly doesn't mean you are becoming a sociopath. This is a live streaming show and I'll answer your questions at the end of my short presentation. So please send them to me as we go along. You can also use our super chat function, which CC is me did. Um, thank you so much. Um, so anyhow, um, back to the topic. I have firsthand experience with this one. At one point, while I was trying to put my life back together, I almost didn't recognize myself. There I was, plotting with my cheating husband's mistress to take money from his bank account. Before I married James Montgomery, I would have never thought about such an action. But after he convinced me to blow $227,000 on his ridiculous business schemes, and after I discovered that my entire marriage was a scam, I was angry, broke, and desperate. I did what I have to do to survive a sociopath, although at the time I didn't know he was a sociopath. Maybe because of your own entanglement, you found yourself doing things that were totally out of character for you. This happened to a reader who posted her story in the Love Fraud Forum. She called herself Stevie. Stevie wrote that her boyfriend invited her to spend the night, and while she was there, he was texting another woman. Stevie lost it. She threw the phone at him, screamed a lot, and then went into the garage and broke every present she ever gave him, like the glasses she gave him for Christmas and a crystal bowl that she gave him for Father's Day. Now, the boyfriend, of course, said everything was all her fault, if she hadn't snooped about his texts, none of this would have happened. Stevie, he said, had no business violating his privacy. Now, this, of course, is a typical sociopathic strategy of deny and deflect. Stevie, in the meantime, was totally embarrassed because she never did anything like this in her life. She said she was ashamed and her self-esteem was gone. Then the boyfriend, so-called boyfriend, told her, told all their friends that she had trashed his house, which of course she did not do. So Stevie posted a question on love fraud. She asked, am I the crazy one? The answer is no, 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 no. Stevie was not crazy. She also had no reason to feel embarrassed. She was simply reacting to the insanity and the betrayal perpetrated by her sociopathic boyfriend. With their deception and manipulation, sociopaths do two things. They break all the rules of social interaction and they push us to the limits of our endurance. When we face physical danger, financial destruction, or a complete loss of self, we reach the point that we must do whatever is necessary to protect ourselves. Sometimes that means bending or even breaking the rules. We've probably learned already that the rules aren't going to help us. And sometimes it means flying into a rage. After tolerating so much abuse, we either have to release our emotions or we'll self-destruct. So we lash out in anger. Now, Anger for most normal people is a pretty scary emotion, probably because we have bad memories of being the brunt of someone else's anger. But anger, when warranted, actually protects us. It spurs us into action, 
such as expelling the sociopath from our lives. When we do things that are so contrary to our nature, like lashing out and lying or breaking things, our actions surprise us. We wonder if we have become just as bad as our tormentor. Yes, our behavior in a particular situation may resemble that of a sociopath, but no, we have not turned into sociopaths. We are reacting to the sociopath's provocation. They are the ones who are at fault, not us. Now, I would not criticize anyone who has been targeted by a sociopath and reacts aggressively. However, I will say that sometimes it can be a tactical error. I've heard from plenty of people who were so angry that they finally hit the sociopath and then found themselves arrested for domestic violence. I've also heard from people who screamed at the sociopath in anger, only to learn that the sociopath recorded the entire tirade and later used it against them. So what do you do? What if you're still in the midst of extricating yourself? What if the sociopath still has the ability to create havoc for you? Well, I do recommend getting the anger and other negative emotions out of your system, but without directing them towards the sociopath. Maybe you scream while you're driving down the highway alone in your car. Maybe you hit a punching bag. The idea is to get the emotion out of your system without giving the sociopath the satisfaction of knowing that you're upset. Another benefit of doing this, of releasing this pent up anger, is that when you do it, you are better able to think and plan, rather than just reacting to the later, latest provocation. Sociopaths can drive us to violate our own standards of behavior, but that does not mean we turn into sociopaths. And how do we know? Because we feel badly about our actions sociopaths do not. So how do you get back to your old self? The answer is to escape the sociopath. Once this person is out of your life and you're on the road to recovery, you will return to your regular self. So that's the presentation for tonight. Um, next, I'll answer your questions. I see that we have some uh, going on here. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we've implemented Super Chat on this YouTube show. So if you'd like to contribute to support Love Fraud's work, uh, that would be lovely. Um, I really appreciate the donations we've received so far, including from CC today. So um, if you'd like to support us, all you have to do is click the dollar sign in the chat window and slide the button to the amount that you want to contribute. And there's also a link in the description below the video window where you can make a tax de deductible contribution to Love Fraud's education if you want. And um, we really appreciate it when you do. So let's uh, take a look and see what we have here. Oh, Diana, $9.99. Thank you, Diana. Appreciate it. Well, Ian says he's a sociopath and he's learning about himself. Okay, well, I hope you get inspired to um, curtail your behavior, if, if that's the case. All right, so, hi Donna, isn't this part of the trauma bond we were in? Also, isn't our action reactive abuse? Um, absolutely, the trauma bond has something to do with the reactions that you experience. Um, that's what's so difficult about getting involved with a sociopath is that, you know, because of the way they treat us, the, the, the psychological bond that we feel gets stronger and stronger, even when we're being mistreated. And the way this works is that all relationships are essentially psychological bonds, a psychological connection that you feel with someone else, someone who's important to you. 
And what happens with the sociopath um, is that they hijack this very normal bonding system that keeps us trapped. And, and the way this works is that the bond starts to be established in the beginning of the relationship through pleasure. Uh, they, they shower us with attention. They tell us how wonderful we are. They want to be with us all the time. So we feel this pleasure, which is the beginning of the bond. And then what happens is the sociopath will do something that creates fear and anxiety in us. And it's usually fear and anxiety of losing this wonderful, magical relationship that we think we have. Um, we catch them lying. We catch them texting another woman, a, a, any of these types of things. So that creates fear and anxiety in us. But amazingly, fear and anxiety actually strengthens the psychological bond that we feel. So then we want to get back to how wonderful the relationship was. So we try and find out what's wrong. We uh, may approach, can't we talk about this? You know, what's going on? We may apologize for things that we didn't even do. Uh, and then the sociopath relents. We kiss and make up and that strengthens the bond again. So this goes around and around and around in a vicious circle uh, where first we have the pleasure, then we have the fear and anxiety, then we have the reconciliation. And with each turn of the wheel, we get the bond gets stronger and stronger and stronger. So, and this is how it evolves into a trauma bond, you know, where, where we feel so attached to this person. We know this person is bad for us, or at least that they're mistreating us, but, but we can't break away. And so, yeah, sometimes because of all this, we could very well lash out uh, and act in a way that is not how we would ever act if we weren't being traumatized by this situation. Oh, ZZ contributed $5. Thank you so much. Oh, so Mary asked, how do you separate a mother from her sociopathic daughter? Um, you know, that can be really hard. Um, I've spoken to lots and lots of people who have disordered family members. Um, parents don't want to give up. You know, they, they don't want to give up on, on the child that, you know, they put so much effort into raising. Uh, they never give up hope. But ultimately, it, it has to be the person who's being taken advantage of. It has to be her decision. I, I assume the sociopathic daughter is taking advantage because that's typically what they do. Um, I've got lots and lots of cases like that. It has to be the the parent who makes the decision, and it's a very difficult decision. I've certainly spoken to lots of people and, and have heard from lots of people who realize that one of their children is disordered, and it's heartbreaking. But the, the mother is the one who has to do it. I mean, you, you might be supportive, but one of the things you want to be careful about is if if you spend a lot of time trashing the daughter or aggressively pointing out her many flaws, which I'm sure there are a multitude, you run the risk of alienating yourself from the mother. So it, it's a real tightrope to try and be supportive without being overbearing because in the end, we can't make a decision for somebody else. You know, they're, they're the ones who have to make their own decisions of, of whether or not they're going to save themselves from further abuse. Okay. So, so Kaina asks, why did the borderline sociopath criticize everything I did but imitated me and applied to my place of employment? Hey. Maybe just to aggravate you, <laughs> maybe to keep tabs on you. Um, 
maybe because they want to continue to exert power and control over you. You know, it, it's often very difficult to answer the question of why a sociopath does anything. Um, but you could keep in mind that essentially what they want is someone to manipulate and exploit. They want power and control. They want to win. And if, you know, going to infringe on your turf and, and your place of employment, um, that's that would be a pretty good way to do it. So I hope the, uh, I hope they didn't get the job. Um, if they do, you might have to consider whether or not you stay there because it'll just be a thorn in your side. They may actively try to, um, create problems for you at work. So, I mean, when, when there's a, a sociopath involved, I mean, the best thing you can do is get yourself out of the situation. Okay, so Ellie says, it's so hard keeping my emotions in check after the abuse, and I feel so broken and emotional. Um, I'm not suggesting that you try to keep your emotions in check privately. Um, it is a good idea to not show your emotions to the sociopath if this person is still around. But privately, you absolutely need to allow yourself to feel whatever it is that you feel because of this encounter. You know, anger, grief, betrayal, disappointment, uh, anything. Um, you need to express it so that you can release that energy. But the idea is to do it privately, not with this person, I mean, there, there's there's no point in expressing your anger to a sociopath because, first of all, it just gives the person, the sociopath, ammunition. Says, "See, you're crazy. You know, you look at that. You can't even control yourself." Uh, and plus, it gives them satisfaction. I mean, they just love the idea that they still have enough control over you that they can send you spinning into a rage. So, uh, none of that is productive. Um, so when you're around this person, if you have to be around the person, absolutely learn to play it cool. But privately, when you're away from this person, let it rip. I mean, you know, you, you, you don't want to get all this trauma building up inside of you. In fact, if you allow yourself to release it, you know, by crying, by, as I said, hitting a punching bag or just a pillow. Um, if it gets it, if you get it out of your system, you won't have that pressure building up and you'll be better able to control yourself if you do have to interact with this person. So I, I'm not at all saying don't express your emotions. I'm just saying don't express it where the sociopath can see it. <clears throat> Okay, um, so Diana asks, how do we stop the emotional roller coaster of romanticizing a sociopath? I don't want to be with him, but I still miss the physical. Well, um, it takes time. It takes distance. Uh, I don't know how long it's been since you ended it or separated, but the longer you are away and the more you can maintain no contact, the more the control, the, 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 the strings that are attached to you will dissipate. Or the spider's web is perhaps a better term because it's a sticky web that you get stuck in. Um, cut yourself some slack. This is, this is really hard. You know, it, it's, it's hard to recover from this type of involvement. Um, so I would say you definitely want to go no contact and no contact means, you know, certainly don't meet the person, don't talk to them, don't visit their social media pages, um, you know, don't, don't spy on them, you know, try and figure out what they're doing now. I, I mean, you really want to do that. And, and this can be hard. You know, I, I know of people who have 
had to trick themselves into staying in no contact. I heard of a person who would, you know, put a rubber band around their wrist and snap it every time she, they thought about the person to remind themselves of, of the pain of being involved. Um, it kind of just takes time. So just keep at it. Do whatever you have to do to distract yourself. And I, I, I heard of one woman who said she did jigsaw puzzles, you know, just to just have something to do that she could focus on and, and not think about the person. Um, sometimes you have to employ your willpower, but this is serious. This is really important. And um, the more you can work on it, you know, the happier you'll be. I'll also say that um, we do have a webinar uh, at education.lovefraud.com on EFT tapping to break your addiction to a sociopath. I've, I've spoken about this before, but EFT, which stands for emotional freedom techniques, it's a, it's a, an alternative type of therapy, kind of like EMDR, but n not really, um, where, where you, you bring something to mind and, and you tap on different places, you know, while you're thinking about it. And, and this stuff is amazing. It, it, it really can help you to recover from the situation and it can help you to break your addiction. So um, I, I would suggest that you take a look at that webinar. Um, perhaps it'll help you. Okay. Okay, so Javiera is saying, had a friend and broke up with the boyfriend and now this friend is getting close and it might be a sociopath. Um, if you figure out that someone is a sociopath, you just need to distance yourself. Um, there's a few ways to do that. Um, you can just kind of ghost them, um, you know, where you just, you know, stop calling, stop returning, uh, returning phone calls, stop replying to emails, something along those lines. Um, which if the person is just a friend, might be the best approach. Uh, it's not like you, you know, you're trying to break up with this person. So um, it's not like you say, well, don't call me ever again. I mean, you could uh, if, if they do something to bother you, but you know, just kind of backing away and being boring um, might be the best approach uh, with someone like that. Okay, so ZZ says, I'm in the middle of a nasty divorce with my sociopath wife. She's been living with another man for the past six months. She has driven by my house three times over the past two weeks. Any idea why? Oh, well, let's see. Um, she might obviously be checking up on you. Um, it could be that the other man is getting ready to dump her and, and she's considering um, if she has to possibly figure out a way to get back with you because she's about to lose where she is. I mean, that's a possibility. Um, it could be just to torment you, um, to apply pressure if, if there's any kind of contentious negotiations going on with the divorce. Um, any of that is a possibility. I would say that, you know, you actually, I don't, I don't know if you're re recording this, if you've got a surveillance camera or something like that, but it might not be a bad idea to have evidence, uh, in case things start to get nasty for any particular reason. Um, so that might be something that you want to consider, you know, especially if you're in the middle of a nasty divorce, because sociopaths in a divorce situation, I mean, they often want to annihilate their former partner. They want to rub you into the dirt. So this is one of those situations where you may need to act like a sociopath. I mean, not that you are one, but you, you need to do what you need to do in order to protect yourself. Um, that can get really tricky. So, you know, be sure that you're being strong in your divorce situation. I hope your attorney understands what he or she is dealing with because sociopaths in the midst of a divorce, I mean, 
they still don't think the rules apply to them. They don't believe in court orders or anything like that. So it could get really nasty. So, I mean, this is, this, today's topic is perfect for you because, you know, sometimes you got to do what you got to do and, and you can't be nice. Okay. So Keitha Morita asks, how long does love bombing and relationship last with a sociopath before you get devalued? Is nine months normal? Um, I don't know that there's a particular number on that. Uh, I have heard a lot of folks on love fraud talk about three months, you know, that the love bombing lasted three months and, and then it was gone. I've heard of it lasting two days and then it's gone. And I've heard of it lasting for years. Um, essentially a sociopath will engage in love bombing and treating you well as long as he or she is still reeling you in or as long as he or she thinks it's useful for whatever his agenda is or their agendas are. So um, there is no rule on that. Um, like I said, it, I, I've heard of people who were involved for years and were treated well, but all the entire time the sociopath was, had a double life going and was taking their money and, and things like that. So um, it could be very short, it could be very long, but if you see that, it, I mean, once you recognize that it's love bombing and, and you see the change coming, uh, you know, it's, it's time to get out. So whatever the situation is, this, just end it. Okay. All right. Um, well, uh, that's all I have time for tonight. Um, thank you all for joining me this evening. And I um, will say that uh, I won't be here next Tuesday taking off for the holiday. Um, but in two weeks, we'll be back with the next episode of Love Fraud Live. So I hope that you'll join us then. Thanks a lot and see you later. Good night.